Don Kirali, you've just brought out a book called A Social Constructivist Approach to Translator Education, Empowerment from Theory to Practice. What do you mean by a social constructivist approach? Um, a social constructivist approach is... Um, it's, an, it's a name I've taken from a plethora of approaches to, um, to uh, epistemology. It's not one particular approach, but it does derive from philosophy. Um, constructivists in general basically believe that the human mind does not mirror the world as it is, but instead that we construct in some form or another, in some way or another, we construct our own understandings of the world. We don't simply reflect what is in the world. And this is really an alternative epistemology when it comes to um, education. Because in, education, in the educational domain from elementary school through college in most countries in the world, the standard epistemology is one of reflection. That is, the individual mind is supposed to reflect reality as it is. Um, the implication of that approach is that a professor has acquired amassed knowledge um, which reflects truth. And that knowledge can in some way be transferred to the student who becomes a master in turn. But it is, uh, it's been described as a conduit approach, a kind of a tube that knowledge is transferred through. From a social constructivist perspective, um, the understanding is that the individual constructs his or her understanding of the world through interaction, through social interaction that the individual alone will never become a socialized person, will never acquire knowledge, will never know in the sense of um, what we know as civilized people. So that's, that's essentially the, the idea. Constructive. That's the social aspect of it. What does that have to do with translation? I think it has a great deal to do with it because it helps to justify and support the approach that I've taken for um, some 15 years on translator training. I began to, uh, to teach translators some 15, almost 16 years ago in Gammersheim in Germany, um, having learned how to teach from my predecessors who learned how to teach from their predecessors. That is, without any training and all using the conduit approach. I went in from, uh, into one class after another with many colleagues and they did exactly the same thing. And I was so bored by this approach and I thought if I were a translation student, I would hate to sit and listen to someone blabber at me um, on, uh, about translation and never getting the opportunity to really do it. Personally, I learned to translate by translating. Um, I never went to any classes on translation. I went out and did it and made lots of mistakes and learned from my mistakes and so on. And I thought it made a lot of sense to bring that into the training system. Social constructivism gives me justification for doing that and explains why it seems to work, uh, why it works for the individual learning outside in the real world, and why it can work in the classroom. So, so that's so why I drew it in. So what do you actually do in the classroom then? Instead of selecting text myself for students to translate on their own, mm -hmm. I encourage the students to find real jobs in the real world, that is, translations that need to be done, uh, either um, a commission, that they have been asked to do. A, a commission means? A means a, jo a job, okay. uh, a job that is commissioned to one of them. That happens very often. Sometimes um, a job is offered to me, and instead of taking it myself, I, I share it with the students. And I have the students work in small groups, essentially, um, to translate different parts of the text or to do different uh, parts of the work. For example, terminology management, background research, whatever it might be. That devolves from the particular job at hand. They work in small groups and they share their ideas on the translation as it emerges. So in a given group, for example, each student might do part of that translation at home mm -hmm. um, and do the same kind of work that they would do in, in a traditional class. But then instead of coming to class and having me as the teacher tear it apart, they will share that translation with other people in the group. And it's a mutual construction process then because each student critiques the other student's work and they learn from each other. And I move from group to group and, and uh, support the work of the individual group and add my own expertise 
especially as it is requested by the students. So, so you're actually doing professional translation projects in the classroom. Are those then given to clients outside the classroom? Uh, yes, always. Um, and are you paid? Very often we're paid for the jobs. We, uh, I can't always find a job at the beginning of the semester that the students can do. Sometimes the jobs that I have are too difficult for them. They're in a domain that is not germane to the student's program of studies. Um, it, because I don't teach technical translation, for example, but sometimes I receive technical translations to do myself. So I do them myself or pass them on to someone else. Um, usually we get paid. Uh, we always get paid in one fashion or another um, because the students see their work published and uh, the money that we receive in any case will go to charity. So the students themselves don't get paid, but there may be a transfer of money. Uh, but in any event, uh, it is real work that's being done. Mm -hmm. I like to call what we do in class pieces of work mm -hmm. rather than exercises. And I try to aim for as many pieces of work as possible and exercises as they are needed. I don't exclude exercises from the classroom at all. But I, they uh, relate to the pieces of work that we're doing and they devolve from that. So what level student, are we, we're talking about advanced students here, final year students who are going to be professional translators the next year or any level? I believe that it can work at any level and I've devised a, uh, a system for myself for uh, applying the approach from the very beginning through the very end but because of curricular constraints at my institution I don't happen to teach translation practice uh, from the first through the fifth semester. Mm -hmm. I only teach at levels beyond that. I do, however, teach the Introduction to Translation practice, uh, Introduction to Translation class, rather, which I see as an opportunity for consciousness raising among the students. And in that class, we do not do professional work. Mm -hmm. We do uh, pre preparatory activities and, uh, to prepare the students to do professional work later on. So the projects that we, ha we have done have, for the most part, been done starting uh, with the fifth semester in Gammersheim after, after, after four semesters of study. Fine. Looking at the work you've done, you, you did a previous book we have here, Pathways to Translation, Pedagogy and Process. That's a very different book in many, many respects. Could you tell us something about how you got from A to B, from your previous book to your most recent book? The uh, Pathways to Translation was actually my uh, dissertation, my doctoral dissertation done at the University of Illinois where there is no tradition of translator training um, or the training of trainers. So I was working with people in a variety of other fields, not in translation studies, and my exposure to the field had come uh, essentially from my colleagues like Hans Hoenig and Paul Kussmaul in Gammersheim and various theorists that I read um, in preparation for my doctoral studies, but I um, drew a lot of that translation studies input from uh, my experience in Gammersheim and merged it with other fields. Uh, for example, secondary education, which is what I studied at the doctoral level, um, cognitive psychology, um, psycholinguistics, and sociolinguistics. So um, essentially, there is a, a merger of these two so two you, approaches. You wouldn't call yourself a translation theorist in that sense? Well, I haven't been trained as a translation theorist. I'm, uh, in essence, a self-taught translation mm -hmm. theorist. But you're drawing on many, many different uh, sources. Certainly. Most of my sources, I would say, come from outside of translation studies, even though I've been influenced by the function functionalist approach in Gammersheim, for example, and in Germany in general. Um, but also by people like Mary Snell Hornby, mm -hmm. her uh, work in translation studies, uh, Gideon Turi, very much so. Particularly, Everything Has Its Price, a wonderful article that is rarely discussed in the literature, but I think, that I think was uh, a key starting point for me to move into this direction with some support within translation studies. Um, but then on the philosophical side, people like Richard Rorty, who is, a, I would say, a social constructivist, and then Piaget, who's uh, more a, of a, well, in today's parlance, he might be called a radical constructivist, who believes more that the, social, the, the cognitive processes are going on in the individual mind. Learning and development are an individual process, more than Vygotsky's view. Vygotsky is very important in my approach, who would presumably 
uh, support the view that cognition is distributed and it's a so essentially a social process, mm -hmm. which is more my present approach. Um, the, the change from one to the other, which you asked about before, um, is a, a natural process of development. I like to see the teacher as a, as a lifelong learner, just as I hope that my translation students see themselves and, and learn to see themselves as lifelong learners, not acquiring everything they need to know by the end of their program of studies, but going on. So I see this as a natural progression from a cognitive science approach, which I took in Pathways to Translation, and I borrowed that from the uh, tradition that was uh, very popular in the mid-1980s, Losha and Krings, for example, who were studying uh, think aloud um, protocols and mental processes. I borrowed a lot of ideas from them and found over time, or ha I have found over the past 10 years, that um, there were some discrepancies between their underlying approach and what I really believed about translation and learning and teaching. And that has allowed me to move on and find and seek out, actually, and eventually find social constructivism to support my views. Well, really, th this first book, the, the Pathways book, is hardcore empirical research mm -hmm. on Think Aloud protocols. You've rejected that entirely, or is it a slow progression? It's, it was a rather radical prog progression because I was forced by the nature of my doctoral studies to do empirical research. Mm -hmm. I was forced by the uh, individuals I was working with, as we all are. We're coerced by systems that we work within to do what is appropriate. And um, qualitative research was not permitted in the institution where I did my doctoral study. So I was forced to put in numbers and do what they called empirical research. My understanding since then has been great about empirical as opposed to perhaps qualitative research has been greatly influenced by Guba and Lincoln and their book, uh, Fourth Generation Evaluation, which is a, um, which tries to demonstrate the value of doing qualitative research over quantitative research, and they call it in terms of social science research, the research methodology of choice. And particularly as uh, Guba um, was a, uh, a hardcore empirical researcher and um, worked with, with hard numbers uh, before realizing that or before finding that qualitative research is more valuable in dealing in the social domain, uh, I find that le provides great credence to his approach. He did not reje reject um, uh, statistics from the very beginning. He was a statistician for years and years at the University of Chicago, for example, and um, moved away radically from that. And I've done something very similar, not because I was latching onto their, their coattails, but because I realized that it fit in better with my approach. That's why. So the move from quantitative to qualitative research means looking at the whole classroom, at case studies of particular projects. Absolutely, absolutely. And not necessarily trying to find um, numbers to justify that a particular approach works. Sure. Don Kirali, I'd, I'd like to go back now. Let's go back and see where Don Kirali is aged about 22, 23, 24. Mm -hmm. Where were you at that stage? Where did you want to get to? Did, did you set out to, to become a translator or a teacher of translation? Um, let's go back just a couple of years before that. When I was 18, June 15th, of that particular year, I graduated from high school, and the last class I had on that day was Spanish. And I demonstrated what I felt about language teaching by climbing out of the window and leaving the school, my high school, on the last day of my secondary education by climbing out of the window. I hated Spanish. You escaped. I escaped. <laughs> I literally escaped, and I'll never forget it. I hated Spanish and I hated French. Uh, a few years later, when I was 23, I found myself on a plane to uh, France, where I had a job as a lecteur at the L'Institut National des Sciences Appliquées in Lyon, where uh, I taught English for three years. And I had no idea when I was 18 or even 22 that I would ever be a translator or even a language teacher. It, it simply happened. Did you climb back in the window? I climbed back in the window by going to the country and realizing mm -hmm. language learning um, in the classroom can be very dead and language acquisition in the country can be a wonderful experience. 
and I have been in Europe ever since, since 1977, because of that experience. You've been in Spain as well? Just for one year. I worked in Gijón for one year, and I lived in France for three, in Lyon, and then went back to Rouen for another year after Spain, and wound up in Gamasheim. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day I went to, I arrived in Gamasheim in 1983, I didn't speak a word of German, I had never translated a line in my life, and um, I remember thinking it would be great to work here someday, but it was a pipe dream at that moment. I had no idea that I would end up teaching, being a translator or teaching translation or writing books on translation, definitely not. So you're now an American living in Germany, working on translation. Do you think you have a, an American approach to translation or to translation teaching more than German, let's say? I don't know that there's an American approach to translation as such, but to teaching definitely. Um, I don't know that we can escape our cultural heritage except by rejecting it completely. And having lived in different countries um, and wanting to retain my identity or an identity, I've decided to remain American. So I continue to speak English whenever I can and so on. And I've hung on to my cultural roots, including a certain uh, belief in democratic processes in education. So I, I would say that my approach is influenced by, by uh, American features of, you know, social features, let's say. Um, and that makes it difficult to um, propose this kind of idea in many places in Europe. Do you definitely. find institutional resistance? to these ideas. Yes, definitely, in many, many places, in some places not. In Stockholm, for example, where I presented these ideas several years ago, I found overwhelming support. But in other uh, places, even in, at the institution where I work, there's been a great deal of reticence to uh, embrace any of these ideas on the part of most teachers, definitely. Fine. You're uh, married. You've been in Gemmersheim for a long time now. Your wife is German. Mm -hmm. uh, you have two young children. Would you hope your children would become translators and interpreters? Is that a career mm -hmm. you would envisage for them? Well, I, I would not try to envisage any career for them. I, um, if they were wondering what should I do and didn't really have a direction, I don't think I would suggest it to them necessarily. If they found on their own that that's something they'd like to do, I would probably encourage them, even though I find it today it's a very difficult job in Germany to mm -hmm. be a freelance translator. I see it. Uh, see the stress that my wife is under. You, you do translate. And my own. Yes, I translate a great deal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. As well as teaching. Right. You combine the two. I feel that I need to do that, or th otherwise I'd have very little to say in the classroom personally. Really? Very little, yes. Is that an implicit criticism of teachers who are not translating? No, not at all. It's simply my own personal view. I feel that I have to, to feel comfortable and confident in the classroom to guide groups of students working for clients. I have to have some idea myself of what that kind of work entails. Mm -hmm. It's only because of the way I work. If I were to be a frontal uh, type instructor, I wouldn't necessarily need that. As a traditional okay. translation teacher, you don't need it, I don't think. Fine. So we've just brought up the Social Constructivist book. Where do we go from here? Well, what, what current projects or interests do you have? This is uh, definitely a, a very elementary a uh, piece of work for me that is uh, I'm at the beginning stages partly because a great deal of it was done in isolation. There are very few people um, who seem to be uh, working in this direction at the moment. I hope there will be more and there will be more of a dialogue. Uh, some things that I'm very interested in are um, reflective, the reflective practitioner approach that Donald Sh uh, Schoen is developing uh, to uh, expertise in the United States for example. Reflective practitioner means we're thinking about what we're doing. Exactly, we do exactly. Well, we're, we're, work, we're working in the field and reflecting on what we've done. And he has a, a, some very useful ideas, I think, for translator training mm -hmm. um, and the training of trainers um, that, that, that could easily be drawn in to the approach, essentially, uh, to the approach that I already have. Uh, it seems to, be to, to dovetail very well with what I'm already doing. Um, expertise studies in general. Uh, this is something I, th I think we need to investigate much, much more than we have. Bring in other fields on the outside and uh, apply them to translation studies. Um, distance learning uh, is something that I'm very interested in. So how do we um, deal with a social constructivist approach via the Internet? 
because you don't have the immediate contact between people that this approach suggests you need. So how do we, we handle that as distance learning becomes more and more popular? Those are, are three particular areas that I'm interested in. Fine. So there's lots of work to be done. Don Girelli, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.